Cardiac infarction. The major complications <coughs> that you have in order of coming in first is actually is retroperitoneal hemorrhage, uh, they followed by arrhythmia, okay, and uh, cardiogenic shock, rupture, okay, followed by ventricular aneurysm and reinfarction and restenosis. These are the various complications that you have when you deal with myocardial infarction. Now, uh, reinfarction and restenosis can is by definition restenosis is the stent has got occluded, that is restenosis. Okay, and that occlusion will cause a repeat of the ST segments to go up. It will cause a repeat of the ST segments to go up in the same territorial place. Okay, it will be associated with hemodynamic collapse because of the fact that you have opened up an artery and suddenly closed it. Definitely, there's going to be perfusion, reperfusion related to arrhythmia, rhythm disturbances, as well as hemodynamic embarrassments. Now, there's a very high chance of happening like that. Huh? Um, you cannot use a troponin to actually distinguish between uh, the fact that he's reinfarcted or restenosed because we know troponin can remain elevated for a long period of time. However, the way to diagnose a reinfarction is actually by looking at the ECG and the echo. Okay, so if the ECG shows a fresh territorial ST segment change, that which could either be ST segment elevation more than one millimeters in all other leads excepting V2, V3, or more than two millimeters in patients more than uh, and males in females or 2.5 less than 45 in those who are in V2 and V3 or an assessment depression of more than 0.5 TV inversion. This is very important for to remember. TV inversion more than one millimeter. So this is something you want to see on your ECG. Every time you want to see on your ECG. If it shows on this ECG any of these characteristics, then I will do an echo and I will see in the echo whether I am seeing some findings which are very different from what it was. Initially it was an anterior wall, now I am seeing an inferior wall. Initially it was lateral wall, now I am seeing apical wall. Something like that is there. Then you are going towards a diagnosis of re-stenosis and re-infarction and this will follow the same criteria. You go back and go into the angiocat suit. You go to the angiocat suit again. Clear? Clear then? Huh? So that is about reinfarction and re stenosis. Huh? The other thing that we are thinking about is arrhythmia, and that's very, very important. Arrhythmia. Okay, which arrhythmias I'm concerned of? I'm concerned of all kinds of arrhythmias. But there are certain arrhythmias in which you must understand that they are normal. So what happens very, very often is you let's discuss first about ventricular tachycardia, one of the most dangerous arrhythmias that might occur in this case. Ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia has three types which you must remember. One is called as ill-sustained ventricular tachycardia. When I say ill-sustained, anybody can tell me what ill-sustained is such a tell me? Ill-sustained. So ill-sustained, what is ventricular tachycardia? What will be the ECG like? It will be broad, broad complex. Very good. So it will be a broad complex, a broad complex that comes. And ill-sustained by definition means less than 30 seconds. Okay, in 30 seconds time it reverts. Uh, in 30 seconds it reverts. When it says sustained ventricular tachycardia, it means more than 30 seconds it remains. Right? Uh, more than 30 seconds it remains. Okay, and when we say ventricular storm or if, uh, ventricular storm, it means what? One minute. It means this patient remains for more than 30 seconds. You have to do something to get that normal and then it recurs three times and it recurs three times in 24 hours. Okay, more than three or more than three times, it will call as ventricular storm. Okay, and when it is called as refractory, it's not going without time. it is not going only, VTAC is not going only, you understand? It just remains as VTAC, 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 VTAC all the time. Okay, that's refractory ventricular tachycardia. Okay? So you can have any of these. So you can have ill-sustained ventricular tachycardia. You can have uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia, which definition is more than 30 seconds. Uh, you can have ventricular storm, which basically means that you are again and again having VTACs three times, four times, and you are requiring some kind of management to get that stop. Okay, and uh, refractory when whatever you are doing is still keeping the patient in VTAC. Clear? Uh, this is the various terminologies you are going to use. Now let's go to ill-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Okay, ill-sustained ventricular tachycardia really does not require any treatment. Okay, so if you get a VTAC, if you get a VTAC that is more than three broad complex rhythms and it is terminating within 10 seconds, 15 seconds, don't worry. 
Okay, don't worry. It may be part of a reperfusion arrhythmia. Uh, it may be a part uh, of uh, you don't go and jump and start the patient on amiodarone, but it is prudent enough enough to actually uh, to send a calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and a potassium. Yeah, it is prudent enough to send this and keep the magnesiums above two milligram per dl. Keep the potassiums close to four mi milligrams per liter. Clear? Uh, so if you have an insustained ventricular tachycardia, don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Your timing should be clear. Clearly, this is occurring and stopping on, on its own. It doesn't need anything for me to stop it. But it is prudent enough that you do a calcium magnesium, potassium, and keep them within normal limits. Huh? In fact, keeping potassium on the higher side is good. Keeping magnesium on the higher side is good. Clear? Huh? This is about ill sustained ventricular tachycardia. Now, when it comes to sustained ventricular tachycardia, I'm a little bit worried. When I say sustained, means it is going more than 30, 30 seconds. seconds. It's going more than 30 seconds. I'm a little bit worried. And I'm even more worried when it is in ventricular storm. Okay. Now, in sustained, uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular storm will have the same management. But the severity or the aggressiveness of management will increase when it is ventricular storm. Why am I worried about ventricular storm? What is the problem? So what happens in ventricular storm? It's like a vicious cycle. Okay, ventricular storm comes in, the body uh, intracellular calcium increases because of that. Intracellular calcium increasing becomes prorhythmic. Clear? Intracellular becomes prorhythmic. Similarly, that ventricular tachycardia is also causing infarction because the blood supply is reducing. Okay, that infarction is again going to cause ventricular tachycardia. Are you understanding? That per se is going to cause chest pain and cause anxiety. That anxiety is going to cause again tachycardia and sympathetic stimulation. So it's like a vicious cycle. We attack, calcium increase, calcium increase causing more uh, prorhythmic uh, potential, ischemia occurring because of V attack, again prorhythmia. Okay, and this cycle of because it's storming means it's going, you are giving a shock or doing something like that and again coming back is impacting again V attack, again V attack, again the cycle keeps on happening, sympathetic storming keeps on occurring. Clear? Uh, clear on this? So V attack is a problem. That is why we need to treat the VTAC properly. It's very important to treat the VTAC properly. Right? Clear till now? Clear? Any, any queries till now? Okay. Now let's go to VTAC uh, that is there and it is it is, it is uh, sustaining more than 30 seconds. What do I do? What is my drug? How do I manage? So if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, huh? you have to cardio uh, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. But what you must understand is that more often than not, the patient might not, might come, uh, might revert at that moment and go back into a problem. Same problem. They flip back into VTAC. They flip back into VTAC. You understand? Because the problem is usually ischemia. So if the patient has not been plastied, if the patient has not been plastied, he will keep on going into that problem again and again. Are you understanding what I am saying? Mm -hmm. uh, if the patient has not been plastic, what is happening? There is an ischemia that has occurred, which has led to an arrhythmia. Okay, you have reverted the arrhythmia at that moment by giving a cardioversion, but you go back into that arrhythmia because you have not plastic or opened up that artery. Mm -hmm. Are you understanding? So this patient needs actually to go rush into the cath lab as quickly as possible to get that plastic done. Clear? This is a post-MI complication. You might find it in n STEMI also. A patient who comes in, he has got MI, troponin, elevated chest pain, came to you, was okay, now develop VTAC. You develop VTAC, what you do? Quickly try to manage that VTAC at the same time, call the cath lab because you need to get the patient to a cardiologist quickly. You understand? Huh? Clear of this first part of the story? Huh? As I told you, how do I improve my stock success? How do I improve uh, the conversion from VTAC to NSR? To improve that, the first thing you can do is to stabilize whatever is there. Now what did I tell you in the start? Calcium is going inside. Calcium is going inside. When calcium is going inside, what is happening? Pro-rhythmic. The rhythm is disturbances, so rhythm is becoming more rhythm problems, more VTAX because calcium is going inside. What is the treatment of hypercalcemia? One thing you can do to stabilize this is by giving magnesium. You understand? One thing you can do to stabilize this is by giving magnesium. How do you give magnesium? 4 grams. Directly give 4 grams. Give 4 grams over 20 minutes. Huh? Give 4 grams over 20 minutes. Clear on this? Huh? 
more uh, there will be no problem at all if you are going to give 4 grams there is not going to be any kind of problem you give 4 grams of magnesium sulfate meanwhile send your magnesium levels you don't need a magnesium level to actually do this because we know magnesium will help to stabilize the membrane huh? you got the point it will reduce the rhythm potential that is going to come into the heart so you, you are not wrong in giving 4 grams of magnesium sulfate quickly you can give it over 20-25 minutes also clear? 4 grams of magnesium sulfate uh, do not worry, it's not going to cause respiratory paralysis and all those things. It's not going to occur. For toxicity to occur, you require to have a, a, inside of the body more than 7. It is not going to occur. Okay, as long as he's passing the urine, it is not going to occur. Clear? Now, along with that, I will also give one more drug. Which drug will I give? Along with that. The drug I want to give is amiodarone. I will give amiodarone. Now, how do I give amiodarone here? <coughs> Three hundred milligrams bolus dose to be given, followed by followed by one milligram per minute for six hours, followed by 0.5 milligram per minute for the next sixteen hours. That is how you will give amiodarone. Okay, I will give three hundred milligrams bolus uh, over 25-30 minutes, followed by one milligram per minute for six hours, followed by 0.5 milligram per minute for the next sixteen hours. Right? Huh? When I do this, then my shock success is higher. When I do this like this, my shock success is higher. Uh, clear on this? My shock success becomes better when I do these things together. Importantly, what I must remember that I cannot give amiodarone more than 2.2. 2.2. 2. 2. 2. 2.2 grams in the whole day I cannot give huh? in 24 hours. So I may want to give some more boluses, but I have to keep in my mind I don't want to give more than 2.2 grams in the whole day. Okay, by giving 900 and 300, you are not going to point, it's only 1.2. You understand? So I can give more bolus. Don't be worried. Patient will be like, give another bolus, no problem. You understand? There is no problem with that. Clear? So my first drug that I want to give this patient is? Magnesium. Magnesium, followed by amiodarone, followed by shock if possible. If that is not there, then next drug? The next drug I want to give is? So why is this occurring? There is an MI. MI has caused what? A scar. A scar is causing the arrhythmia to occur again and again. So the drug I want to give is a membrane stabilizer, something that will reduce the sodium potential is lignocaine. Is lignocaine. I want to give lignocaine. How do I give lignocaine? How do I give lignocaine? So it's 100 milligrams. 100 milligrams of lignocaine you give IV, followed by 1 to 2 milligram per minute. 2 mg per minute and titrated upwards. Okay. 1 to 2 mg per minute and titrated upwards. So, how much have you given xylocard? 100 mg of xylocard. That's around 4 cc, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's around 4 cc of xylocard that you have. 1 is 20 mg, right? Mm -hmm. 1 cc is 20 mg. So, 4 to 5 cc of, of xylocard I give, followed by 2 mg per minute. This is what my dose will be. Okay, to start on these patients. So, my first drug I'm going to give is definitely magnesium amiodarone. That's not working, I'm probably going to start from Xylocard. Okay, Xylocard is going to give it uh, to a 100 mg stat and 2 mg per minute is what I'm going to start. Now, this also doesn't work. What do I do next? So, go back to the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology says what? The pathophysiology says calcium going inside, uh, reinfarction occurring, reinfarction causing more. Reinfarction is said about plastic. Uh, then we again say that more chest pain, more sympathetic stimulation, more going up. So what is the problem here? Sympathetic stimulation. Now how do I? Beta blockers. Beta blockers. Okay. Uh, so sympathetic stimulation comes in place. So we want beta blockers in place. Now which are the beta blockers you think of? Which is the best? Propranolol. We just discussed. The best beta blocker you can think for sympathetic drive going down is actually Propranolol. Clear? Huh? But this is only in cases that we are following that, what we, what we wrote in the starting. What did we write? No failure, huh? no LG dysfunction, no extreme dysfunction, then? No shock. No, no, shock. no shock. Heart, heart rate is calling blood pressure, no shock, which is terminal effect time, not okay. Huh? Huh? No PM, more than 250 milli, milliseconds. That is the place that I'm going to use my propranolol. I have given all these things. 
I give all these things. Patient is not improving. Protonol not there. I can't, could not give protonol because this there was some amount of failure. What do I do? No, it's not going to do anything. No, it's not going to do anything as of, as of now. It only drops. Since you cannot give beta blocker, you can't give calcium channel blockers. What are you left with? How do I get off the sympathetic drive? Because we are doing this, no? We are in that sympathetic drive where we are. We finish this. How do I get the sympathetic drive off? How do I do that? Anti anxiety, but what? What can I give? I give an opioid, right? I give an opioid and get my anxiety down. But it's a problem to give opioid to the patient like this. What do we do? How to facilitate to give all these things to remove, remove sympathetic drive? What we can do? Intubate the patient, put him on sedation. Otherwise, the vicious cycle will not go. The patient will remain in the vicious cycle of. Uh, VTAC, 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 VTAC again and again. So what do I do with this patient? I intubate this patient. Huh? You are understanding? Because every time he's in a storm, you are cardioverting, you are causing injury, it is going to cause more VTAC, 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 VTAC. It is not going to improve. So I need to get off the sympathetics. To get off the sympathetic, one of the ways to do that is by actually intubating your patient and doing what? Sedation. With sedation. Dexter, can you type it? Can you titrate Dexem? No. You understand? Dexem that cannot be titrated, it's not easily titratable. You titrate Nikol Satyavasko. Okay. Huh? Huh? Propofol. If the BP, if you can maintain the BP, the best term you can give is Propofol. If the BP, the question is if the BP is getting maintained, I can give Propofol. My problem here is what? To get my sympathetics under control. Right. So if I can manage a little bit with propofol, nothing like it. So sometimes what does occur is BP is around 120, 130. You start 5, 6 ml per hour, 10 ml per hour of propofol. 10 ml per hour of propofol you start. BP might drop from say 120 to 100. You can start a very small dose of vasopressin. The drug you will give is why not dopamine? Why not norad? Why not adrenaline? Why not? Uh, exactly. So the drug of choice comes as. Vasopressin. So I will give a very small touch dose of vaso or maybe very small dose of noradrenaline which will help to keep my propofol on so it get my sympathetics down. This is what is clinical working, working clinically in the ICU. Okay, huh? so I will give propofol and I will see. See, I cannot tolerate this patient, just does not tolerate propofol. Okay, then what do I do? The drug I can give is ketamine. Ketamine. Okay, a simple drug that can be given is ketamine. Maintain your blood pressure, cut off the sympathetics. Okay, what are the That also doesn't work then. Midazolam, benzodiazepines. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. huh? So in order of preference, I would say uh, to start with propofol, doesn't work, go to ketamine, doesn't work, go to midazolam and, and anyways on the background start dexmedetomidine. Because dexmedetomidine will take a long time to act. It is not something that you can titrate. So maybe I can give a combination of ketamine and dexmedetomidine called as ketodex. I'll start that. Okay, ketamine and dexmedetomidine, which will help me both the ways. Clear? Clear on this? Huh? Then, if this also doesn't work, I mean, it will not drop the sympathetic as much. We do get a sympathetic out, you'll require 500 microgram per hour of fentanyl. You know, that will cause other problems. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, because it will require very high amounts to get off the uh, to get off the synthetics. Yeah. Huh? Then, but you can try it. I mean, there's no harm in trying it uh, after all. But it will not be the first drug I want to give. Huh? Then, then, how do I get off the synthetics physically? Physically, how do I get off the synthetics? Two, two things you can do. Huh? No? No. Stellate ganglion block. So stellate ganglion block is something you can do. Huh? And the second thing is? Second thing is? Thoracic epidural. Thoracic epidural. You understand? Huh? So there are, so in order of preference, uh, I would go from starting down again. We start with magnesium and amiodarone. Uh, try a cardio version, attempt cardio version not working, you go to the next drug, which is the next drug? Lignocaine. Lignocaine not working, next? Beta blocker. Huh? Beta blocker if it's possible, if it's not possible? 
in mechanical ventilation and deep ventilation using propofol, ketamine, dexamethasone, medi, midazolam, mm -hmm. and this also not working. Select ganglion block not working. Thoracic epidural. So this would be the entire process when you are dealing with ventricular tachycardia. That is sustained ventricular tachycardia. Okay, sustained. Okay. Now here, importantly, what you must understand is sometimes you may have polymorphic. What we discussed was all monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Monomorphic, wide complex monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. You may also have polymorphic. Okay. Now polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a completely different uh, situation. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia can be because of non-ischemic causes. It can be because of just magnesium drop. Mm -hmm. That is completely different. But you can also have polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with short QT interval, which is ischemic. That is what you must differentiate. You must differentiate polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is ischemic by short QT interval. So, what is the short QT interval? So, that is polymorphic B, uh, QT. Okay. So, when you have polymorphic ventricular tachycardia with short QT, then the management follows this management that we just now discussed. Otherwise, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia does not require this management. Otherwise, polymorphic uh, is just magnesium. Okay. What we discussed was monomorphic. We can have polymorphic also, and polymorphic you must figure out QT interval and then discuss this, then decide what is to be done. Clear? Polymorphic so now we have done ventricular tachycardia, ill sustained and sustained, we have done ventricular storm, and we have done polymorphic VT. Now the another complication that is mentioned over there is atrial fibrillation flutter. Atrial fibrillation flutter. Huh? Are we worried about this? I will be worried in certain cases. Which are the cases in which I'll be worried? So if I have a patient who has come with echo, I, I have another patient who has come with MI, you have done an echo, huh? and uh, now the patient develops atrial fibrillation, when are you worried? When the artery is supplying the SNO, no. When am I worried? On, when am I worried? I am not worried. When am I worried? So why am I worried? When am I worried? It will be relation. Whenever there's going to be hypotension. When am I going to have hypotension? The question is, when am I going to have hypotension? Atrial fibrillation. When is the chances of having hypotension? Why does atrial fibrillation cause hypotension? When is it? Why is atrial fibrillation? Because atrial kick is getting lost. So which of the conditions in the heart is dependent on atrial kick? That's the question. So A to diastolic heart failure. So if the patient has got diastolic heart failure, the feeling will not take place if there is no atrial kick. That patient can go into hypotension. Then, mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis. Uh, you have a patient of mitral stenosis, it is purely dependent on the atrial kick. They require the atrial kick. Mitral stenosis. Third one, pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension. They are dependent on that atrial kick to fill the ventricle. They are dependent on the atrial kick to fill the ventricle. You are understanding? Huh? So three conditions in which I am very worried. Three conditions that are very worried, diastolic dysfunction or diastolic heart failure, the second is mitral stenosis and the third thing is pulmonary hypertension. I am worried about all these three conditions. Now, in these three conditions, if I develop atrial fibrillation, the chances of having hypertension are very very high. Clear? Okay. Huh? One more thing you must remember is uh, when you have ventricular tachycardia, we did say about the fact that we also should know which are the ones that are malignant or problematic in when we come to VTAC. Uh, in VTAC, if the heart rate is less than 100, no? if the heart rate is less than 100, usually they are AIVRs, accelerated idioventricular rhythms, which are reperfusion rhythms. Reperfusion rhythm arrhythmia. Someone may have a word wrong. If VTAC you are occurring and the VTAC rate is less than 100, usually this is AIVR. AIVR means accelerated idioventricular rhythm that is occurring because of reperfusion. It is actually good. Is actually good rhythm. You are understanding, no? Huh? Because we did talk about ill sustained and sustained VTAC and all these things, but we did talk about the rate of the VTAC. Okay, so if the rate of the VTAC is less than 100, if the rate is less than 100, I am really not worried. So I am worried. I am really not worried. Clear of this? Huh? Because less than 100 is usually AIVR. It is basically reperfusion arrhythmia. Clear of this? Reperfusion arrhythmia. You will inform the cardiologist and you will say, sir, probably this is AIVR. Because heart rate is low. I am worried about VTAC when the heart rate is fast. Okay. Now similarly, you did you did say that about atrial fibrillation, I am worried about uh, in these three cases that if the patient gets atrial fibrillation, I am worried. Huh? Concerning the rate, when are you worried? Are you worried with the rate? Fast ventricular rate. So what is fast? 
long term mortality long term major adverse cardiac events rate control and rhythm control are the same okay however you must understand that if you are just going to do rate control and the rhythm is abnormal you will require lifelong anticoagulation if the chances to move into a rate from a rate to rhythm control is easier no comfortable isn't it it's more comfortable because you don't have anticoagulation it's easier okay so that's about uh, arrhythmia that we talked about arrhythmia okay heart block we just talk about heart block on that now heart block which are the cases that you will possibly consider heart block and how do you find out what is happening ischemic heart block ki kya hai so usually when you have an inferior wall myocardial infarction if you have an inferior wall myocardial infarction the problem is in the av node okay the problem is in the av node and that's why you have ventricular escape okay you have ventricular escape you understand ha av node par kaam nahi kar raha atrial ventricle ja nahi raha to ventricular escape ho jayega broad complex theek hai clear on this ha ियलोकेट्रोपे Of course, it will need a, it will need the stent to be done and all these things. But patients will escape. But if this patient is having block below the AV node, then where is the problem? The problem is actually in the left anterior descending artery. The problem is in the LED. So if the problem is in the LED, there's a large part of the heart that has been occluded. Okay, now that will cause this patient not respond to all these things. He will require pacing. He will require uh, stenting and all these things quickly. Clear? Huh? That's about heart block. clear hmm? heart block then the third thing is rupture so and uh, the, the very important thing that you have to look at look for is uh, i mean before that is hemorrhage hemorrhage so you have radial artery you have femoral artery so they cannulate what the radial artery radial artery will not have any hemorrhage there is no problem but what i worried about is the femoral so in the femoral artery if they cannulating they it can go retroperitoneal and the hematoma can occur retroperitoneal you understand retroperitoneal hemorrhage no retrograde hemorrhage is, is not easy to diagnose so that is why in the morning after uh, when you are actually looking at this patient uh, in the morning after the plasty where is from where have you done the plasty is it run run to the femoral area or is it on the radial if i have a radial i am happy there is no retrograde hemorrhage never going to occur but if there is going to be in the femoral i have to look for it how will i look for it look at pallor we don't repeat hbcdc in these patients we don't repeat, uh, look at hbcd uh, we don't do that Huh? So you look at pallor, look at tachycardia, look at back pain, flank pain, tenderness, back pain, flank pain, tenderness. Okay, these are things that you will probably get in these patients. Okay, flank pain, back pain, and tenderness. These are the things that you will get. You will get groin hematoma. You might get, you might get groin hematoma, but later on, you will get diagnosis with back pain, flank pain, and tenderness. Clear? Huh? Clear on this? What do you do in these cases? How do you diagnose it? USG. USG is later on you can't see much. You do a CBC in the first place. You do a CBC in the first drop place. You are not done a CBC. You do a CBC. Find the drop in HP. <coughs> the drop in HP signifies that there is bleeding somewhere, isn't it? Drop in HP. Now, where is the bleeding find out what to do? CT scan. Directly a CT scan. Okay, directly a CT scan. So a CT scan will tell you there is retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And how do you tackle this? do a ct angio and call interventional radiology not explore mm -hmm. huh so ct you do a ct angio because the ct angio will tell you where it is whether there is active bleeding and if there is active bleeding whom i want to call an interventional radiologist will come and plug that baby if there is active bleeding clear other way around these patients also can have retroperitoneal hemorrhage without it being from the femoral area it can be just because patient has received anticoagulation okay so at that stage that is why we doing a ct angio Okay, because you might not find a bleeder. If you are not finding a bleeder, there is a possibility this might be spontaneous retroperitoneal hemorrhage because of the anticoagulation. You, you understand? Huh? Retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Yes, but we don't need it. Yes, we don't need it like that. <coughs> Clear? Huh? Then the next step that we have in these cases is 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 this rupture about this rupture. very important okay very very important rupture uh, we also forgot a very another important thing called as dressler syndrome which is not put away huh? so 
it first comes to rupture. So what is rupture? When you say rupture, what is going to happen is it may either or rupture the ventricular free wall. <coughs> that means large territory anterior wall myocardial infarction, necrosis and rupture. When the rupture occurs, patient needs to go to surgery. You cannot save the patient. Patient needs to go for surgery. It ruptures and it shock for some time because of the pericardium it tap on artery. Okay. Uh, you see a rupture, you send the patient for surgery. There is no other way you can save this patient. Right? Uh, the other two ruptures that we talk about, cordate anterior rupture and ventricular septal defect. These are th something that you have to pick up. So what happens with an MR is unfortunately you cannot, the murmur may not be evident. Like how we say an MR. Because there is too much an equalization of pressure because it's a free you know, MR, coordinate anterior rupture, tough curve. So the, the, the murmur that you normally should get may not be there. Murmurs comes only when the pressures are much different. Uh, the pressure is almost equalized with the LA and the LV when, the, when it ruptures so badly. So you may not get the murmur. But anytime you are seeing a patient post MI, auscultation becomes very important because there are two murmurs that might come in. One is the machinery murmur, which is which is synechronon for a ventricular septal defect. Uh, and the other is mitral regurgitation murmur. Okay, the MR murmur sometimes maybe uh, might occur also because of left ventricular dilatation. Okay, the MR murmur can also occur because of left ventricular dilatation. It cannot be just, you cannot diagnose based on a papillary muscle dysfunction. You cannot diagnose a cordate tendon rupture based on this. But a ventricular septal defect and a cordate tendon rupture will also be accompanied with a chest pain. There will be a chest pain because, you know, muscle is dying. So there can be a chest pain. Clear on that? Clear? Clear? PSD and cordate tendon rupture, clear on this? Huh? What do you see? Pulmonary edema. What do you, how you will treat? How you will treat? How you will treat? There is permanent edema, how do you treat? Reduce the afterload. Reduce the afterload here. Because your ventricular septal defect is going to move left to right. You have movement of the blood from left of the heart to the right of the heart. Right? How can you make the heart, uh, how can you make this blood move from left to the iota? Only when you reduce the afterload. At this moment, the right ventricle is at a lower pressure, left is at a higher pressure. So, characteristically, the blood will flow from here to here. I want the blood to flow from here to the iota. And to move it to the iota, I have to reduce the afterload. That is why I need to give very high doses of afterload reduction. You know, afterload reduction. This is what I by NTG. So I use NTG and I try to get my afterload down. This is the scene with both these ventricular septal rupture or cordate tendon rupture. I will have to reduce my afterload. Clear? Only when my afterload comes down will my forward flow or cardiac output improve and my BP gets better. Mm -hmm. huh? Cardiac output will improve. Clear on this? Afterload has to come down. So I am going to use NTG here. Clear? Huh? So how do you diagnose a ventricular free wall rupture or a sept uh, ventricular free wall rupture? Uh, so what happens is when you are doing the echo, if it be less than one centimeter size, less than one centimeter size, one moment you see pericardial effusion less than one centimeter size, you must think okay maybe this is either either this is the phenomenon of pericarditis or if it is more than one centimeter, there is ventricular free wall rupture. Both the cases, when there is an effusion, both the cases, what you what will you omit? What is the drug you omit? Which is drug you omit in both the cases? If you get pericardial effusion of this, what will you omit? At one centimeter, more than one centimeter. Anticoagulation. I will remove my anticoagulation because this will convert to cardiac tamponade. Okay. Uh, I will convert to cardiac tamponade. Clear on this? Clear? Any, any doubts till now? Uh, I will convert to? I will stop my anticoagulation. Clear? <clears throat> okay. So that's about uh, what did we talk about? Uh, this ruptures, right? Now the last of the topic is pleuroperitoneal uh, is is is, uh, is Dressler syndrome. Okay, Dressler syndrome. Have you heard about Dressler syndrome? What is the Dressler syndrome? Which is uh, after the MI uh, because of the cardiac injury, the pericarditis occurs. Pericarditis occurs, right? So it can occur pleuropericarditis. There can be pleuritis as well as pericarditis. It is important to remember it like this because. The pain that comes is different from the pain that you see after MI. The pain is very different from what you see after MI. What is the difference in the pain? Now MI, you characteristically call it as a crushing deep pain that is there is radiating to the jaw, 
and irritating to the left hand. And this is the classical description of an MI pain, right? What is the pain here? The pain in this is usually like a pleuritic pain. Now, on respiration, the pain increases. Second thing, this pain actually radiates to the trapezius, to the trapezoid muscles. Okay. And third thing, third thing, the pain relieves when the patient is bending forwards. These are, this is characteristically described. And this normally occurs not immediately, it occurs after a week. Up to three months it can occur. It can occur after a week, up to three months. Pericarditis. Right? This is about uh, this is about the pain, description of the pain. Right? Obviously, if a person has had a myocardial infarction and has ST and has been put in a stand, he will be concerned of this pain. He will come to you. He will come to you. Alright, he will come to you. But it is your responsibility to figure out whether it is a re-infarction, re-stenosis, or it is the presence of pericarditis or Dressler's syndrome. Right, Dressler's syndrome. So now, when this occurs, what are the ECG changes? It can cause global ECG changes. All ST segments can be down, all ST segments can be up, AVR can be up, a lot of things can occur. But it will be global, it will not be regional. Okay, it will be, be global, everywhere it can occur. Right? Uh, ST segments, T wave inversions, these are the things that will occur. Like in pericarditis, it's called. Right? Huh? And that's why we call it pleuritis and pericarditis because the, you remember it as a pain being the same. Okay. Then, what can you see on echo? On echo, you may be able to see a pericardial effusion. Okay. The moment the pericardial effusion is more than 1 centimeter, what do I need to do? Stop my anticoagulation immediately. Stop my anticoagulation immediately. You understand? That's very, very important. But you will find a pericardial effusion when you're not supposed to find. You understand? You are not supposed to find a pericardial effusion, you start finding a pericardial effusion. So that goes in favor of uh, this patient being having post uh, pericarditis syndrome. Right? Clear? How do I treat this? How do I treat this? So EOG, ECG, echo, uh, we also talked about the symptoms. So what, how do you treat this? No, so I give very high dose of aspirin. My aspirin dose become very high. You may want to give 1000 milligrams 4 times in a day. 1000 milligrams 4 times in a day I can give. So obviously this patient will may have the chance of having a ulcerative ulcer and things like that. You have to give a high dose pantosic along with it. Okay. You may have you may want to give very high doses of aspirin. 1000 milligrams, 750 milligrams 3 times in a day. Okay. Huh? The other drug you can use is colchicin. The other drug you can use is colchicin. And the third drug you can use is brufin. Okay, these are few drugs, of course, Brufin, I don't want to use NSAID, it's an NSAID, it's not something I want to try, uh, because prostaglandin synthesis admission is something that I won't do it when there's a heart problem. So that's why aspirin, colchicin, uh, are the few drugs that I probably want to use when there is uh, this kind of Dressler's syndrome. This can last for a long period of time, but monitoring is important because pericardial effusion, if it worsens, it can become cardiac tamponade. It can become cardiac tamponade. Okay, so we have gone through almost all the complications that are required in after post uh, uh, myocardial infarction. You know? So these are the complications you must remember when you are actually looking in your, uh, in, you must remember these complications because it's not going to come in all patients. But when it comes, you must be able to distinguish what I am supposed to act on, what I am not supposed to act on, what I am supposed to be worried on, what I am not supposed to be worried on, how do I treat them at that particular moment, what do I do further, huh? that should be very clear in your mind. Okay, any questions on uh, post myocardial infarction complications? Nothing, huh? Actually, you can stop this, huh?